behalf of a special branch, oops, I mean the Workers' History Society, for uh, attending this uh, function. Uh, what, what we're going to, the course of the, the events is going to be, we're going to show, I'll show, be showing this documentary, The Camera of Graham Garner, and then after that there's going to be the presentation of the Eureka Australia Day medals to Graham and Esme, and then we'll just mill around for a bit, and at four o'clock, um, Someone's going to come in to sort of entertain us with a few songs. So um, that's basically what's going to happen. I'll start the, um, the documentary to begin with. Um, and I'll have to get out of the uniform because I can't see it. What about that 50 bucks, John? You don't want to get arrested. You don't want to spend more time in the watch house, Garner. <laughs> Jay, who didn't turn up, Jay did the sort of uh, camera work. I don't think Jay's turned up. No, nope. no Jay. Um, obviously Don and uh, Neil Pike did the sound. The sound's fantastic, really. <laughs> 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 uh, but you couldn't hear the sound. Um, so, what? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'd like to thank all those people uh, you know, who helped me produce that. Um, documentary, and we intend to. I intend to finish it. There'll just be a little bit more about this ceremony today, and the award of um, to Graham and Esme, just to finish it off, because it's a bit sort of um, sad the way it ends so far. Um, but it is going on a, a slightly happier note. <laughs> oh no, it must be dreadful to watch. Anyway, uh, uh, so we're just going to. Barbara's going to tell you a bit more about the Eureka Australia Day medals. I'll just, um, should I just say a bit about Graham and Esme? Yeah. yeah um, anyone else who would like to stand up and say something about Graham and Esme? Right, well, basically that, that sort of covered Graham's story a fair bit, so I won't go into that. Um, uh, Esme was involved with the Union of Australian Women and the Save Our Sons Committee during this, this is during the 60s. When the couple left the Communist Party and became involved with the self-management group, Esme worked casually in the red and black bookshop. She was working in the bookshop when the police raided and seized a little red school book, and Esme was charged over this. On um, Esme's ASIO file, ASIO have this to say about Esme. It would appear that Esme Garner is responsible for keeping all SMG files and records and for typing stencils for notices and circulars and for the dispatch and handling of all correspondence for SMG activities. It is known that the distribution of leaflets by the industrial group were left to the Garner family. So, ASIO appreciated your work. <laughs> uh, Graham was diagnosed with cancer in 1972, which he survived. and. Esme began working to support the family as a typist in the Commonwealth offices under Gough Whitlam. Her ASIO file would have prevented her employment under the Liberals. She also benefited from the Whitlam government's introduction of free university education to become a speech therapist. In the 1970s, the family relocated to Geelong near Maryborough, where they became involved in the anti-high rise committee and Graham read for local council. Um, and you've heard the sort of story of that too. So um, I'll just sort of leave it there. And uh, Barbara's going to come up and tell us a bit about the Eureka Australia Day medals. And um, so. Would anyone else want to say
they're actually brass made by a, a local Melbourne artist, and because of the the weather, the wet weather, this one has got. Okay, so this is um, some verdigris set in, which I thought was a really nice symbolic touch. Black, black heart and um, green <laughs> environmental credentials over the top. <laughs> okay, um, so they're made by apparently by a local um, artist in, in Melbourne. Um, the Anarchist Media Institute in Melbourne, um, they have decided to put a bit of emphasis on researching um, their local history because they, they believe that you know history is written by the elites usually and and um, there's a lot of things in Australian history that have have been written out of history. Um, uh, the things which would be interesting to most people and to us specifically have been written out and they've taken the Eureka uh, Rebellion as one example of this. Um, usually a lot of people have grabbed hold of the Eureka Rebellion like bikies, you know, have it on their bikes and um, builders, labourers, and, and all sorts of people, because, and they've grabbed the, um, the symbolism of the flag and the nationalistic sort of aspect. But um, Joe Toscano and the people down there have, have been doing a lot of research into Eureka, and they've come up with some interesting things, uh, and some things which, from the point of view of um, anarchism, are quite interesting. Um, as most people know, there were actually quite a few mass meetings at Eureka. Um, when they had those grievances, and people, people um, after the mass meetings, they they sort of um, they swore an oath and that they'd all stand together, they'd be, they'd have solidarity with each other, and um, uh, there were, the composition of the people was also extremely interesting. Something which you don't hear about much. Um, it was very very international, um, as people on the gold fields were. They came from all over the world. There was um, an Italian man who actually had been in the 1848. Uh, revolutions that swept Italy and, and Europe. Um, he was, yeah, that's right, Cavani. And he wrote a book about it, which is now back in print. Um, his, but uh, it's a bit hard to read because he's got a lot of you know, Italian constructions in the sentences. It's, yeah, in, it's, it's in very, English. It's, 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 very, good it's a bit work, dense. It? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit dense to read. Um, but um, it's very interesting. There are quite a few charters. People, the charters movement were these people in England who wanted to extend the franchise because in the 1830s and 40s, you know, there was, um, you had to actually own land and have money to actually run for parliament. So there's quite a lot of people who are quite political, um, whereas most of the idea you get of the, of the Eureka Rebellion is that it's just the modern miners who just, you know, didn't have any political past at all. Um, and the post, the part after the rebellion is quite interesting as well. Um, a lot of people died, but also uh, I think about six people were tried for treason. And they, the first person they put up, they were they wanted convictions. They really wanted convictions because it was the people were quite popular. So they picked an African American guy, and they figured, well, everyone's fairly racist around here, so he's going to get a conviction pretty quick. Um, the jury um, dismissed the case. It was in about ten minutes. And John Joseph was the man's name. He was actually carried through the streets of Melbourne by cheering crowds. And every single person who was up for um, um, treason was their case was dismissed. So it was very popular in its day. As the years have gone on, you know, it sort of has become more like just a national symbol. You know, they take the aspect of the Southern Cross rather than the Union Jack and this sort of thing. But the main point of what I think what um, the Anarchist Media Institute is trying to do is trying to get people to look at their local history, trying to find um, history of ordinary people working working people's history, and try and research that. Um, as a way of, of getting links, because um, we're all involved to greater or less extent with politics, and getting links to people in the past, because it's um, to our advantage to, to know about our past, and that way we can sort of keep a continual tradition and a community of people going. Um, so, um, I can't remember what else I was going to say. Oh, yes, um, last year after um, Bobby Walker died, I thought, well, you know. Um, we, sh we should have actually had a presentation for Bobby. <laughs> and I rang Joe Toscano, but he said, Bobby never ever wanted to have any um, any presentations or anything like this. Um, so then I thought, Graham and Esme would give, give them something. So I nominated Graham and Esme, and I was going to go down to Melbourne to pick up their, um, their award, but broke my wrist, unfortunately, so I missed out. And so this is why they're up here. Um, and so before I, I give the... Um, the medals out. Um, would anyone like to say 
little bit extra about their memories of working with Grand and Esme? Well, yeah, true. Um, you want to come out the front? Yeah. Well, I didn't come prepared for this speech or anything, but I, I'm really pleased to, um, um, to be able to, to see this honour for Graham and Esme. They're two of my favourite people and in the whole world. And uh, I just think it's wonderful to be able to give an award like this to people like that who, for their whole lives, have been examples of courage. And, uh, and Forsyth. Uh, and I still remember the, the first SMG meeting I went to, actually, which was in uh, Graham and Esme's house. And, uh, I can see a few people in this room there that were in, in the same meeting. And uh, um, Graham and Esme were the, um, were the hub of that, that group. You know, we always met in their place. And, uh, uh, and it was a really exciting time for me. I was in my early 20s and um, I'd been uh, studiously staying away from groups um, you know, for a number of years. I, I, I've been to a university and I think I was a first year teacher at the time, early, in my early years of teaching. i um, been very much involved by the university scene and by the anti-war movement, but you know, cautious about joining some group. And I went along to my first SMG meeting at Graham and Esme's and I was hooked, hooked entirely. And I've never been hooked on politics ever since. Um, but they, um, they were a lovely couple, and I learned a lot from them. And um, I'm very, very grateful to uh, to have them as my friends, and they've remained friends with uh, remained friends with them ever since. I'm very, very proud. Uh, Ted Reithwell is my name. I remember Graham from the old days, and. Uh, uh, in those days, he was particularly impressive because he had a certain pugnacious <laughs> approach <laughs> to things. He was the kindest of people, uh, but uh, nonetheless, he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't take a step backwards when it came to the when it came to the struggle. He was very committed to what he took up. Um, I I knew him. Uh, uh, we were in a, um, an unpopular uh, organisation at, at the time, the Australian USSR Friendship Society. Um, people, people in that organisation were there for a number of reasons. Um, some of them uh, considered that uh, although uh, Soviet society was not suitable for emulation, it was important in those Cold War days to uh, develop understanding and friendship with the Soviet people. I believe that uh, that was Graham's motivation. It so happened that uh, this willingness to uh, be in the organisation was uh, was threatened at the time of uh, the uh, Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in uh, 1968. And uh, Graham was sort of part of that uh, movement at, at the time that uh, wanted to distance the society from uh, Soviet foreign policy. So uh, there you go. Um, he was a fitter by trade and a very good one. He had the uh, uh, not only the uh, skills in fitting, but uh, also carpentry, or for that matter, whatever he took up his uh, ability as a photographer is notable. When you see some of these uh, shots here, you'll no doubt see the, the quality of them. But it's very easy to forget nowadays when we've got clever cameras like this, where even an idiot can take reasonable uh, photographs because of the technology. In those days, you had to be very skillful to get decent shots. And uh, I think uh, old Photographers who have tried to achieve that sort of thing realise the quality of uh, Graham's skill as a photographer. Um, so there you go. Um, uh, always been a great admirer of Graham uh, because of his uh, personality, because of his uh, strength of character, and because of all those very fine attributes that he's got. Thanks.
Um, I think I know a fair few of you, but I'm Greg George for those who don't know me. And I was there uh, in those days, those early days, and uh, I was, Ted, what Ted said about pugnacity uh, reminded me that uh, my uh, familiarity and comfort with the rich Australian uh, uh, you know, colloquialisms was, uh, was increased uh, by Graham with various words like grub, uh, <laughs> which was a, a fairly uh, commonly used uh, word for not, not so much scabs, I already knew that word anyway, but uh, used for people in the workplace or in trade unions uh, who were uh, bosses' men. So that's how I learned about grubs and there have been some things happening in my workplace uh, at the moment uh, which have led me to say grub more than once. <laughs> uh, we, we later on made up uh, the, the term uh, tub. Uh, we put out a big broadsheet and tub was trade union bureaucrat. So this big you know, four sides broadsheet, as big as a, as a broadsheet newspaper, analysing and condemning uh, tubs. And in fact, uh, in one of those photos there uh, of a Vietnam rally, I noticed um, uh, Edgerton uh, in one of those photographs. He was uh, one of the most notable uh, tubs at the time. Uh, the other thing that, that, that I was thinking about uh, was about skills. Uh, I've, I've never been uh, terribly manually dexterous. Uh, and uh, not only did we meet at Graham and Esmo's place, we actually built a two-storey building in their backyard. Uh, and saying we means we. People like Drew and I, who uh, are not very capable uh, with... Uh, you, you'll, you'll confess that, won't you, Drew? Reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but under Graham's, under Graham's direction, we built this two-storey uh, two building and we used to meet at the top and underneath we had a printery. And uh, Tony Knipe is here. Where are you, Tony? Yeah, we, we had a, the radio we had, as it was then. Uh, one had a counter on it. At one stage, the counter was uh, 250,000. Uh, and Tony and I used to do most of the printing, so we were very proud of that. So that group of people, on what I consider ultimately a fruitless exercise, that group of people who most of the time we're talking about were known as the self-management group, uh, we didn't just talk uh, these ultimately rather silly ideas about revolution, uh, but and other reasonable ideas like opposing uh, opposing uh, war and uh, and putting forward ideas for democratising society and so forth. We didn't just talk about it. I mean, we we did it. We were out there, uh, you know, walking neighbourhoods and letterboxing. We had people in uh, in all areas of work. Uh, some some stage. Uh, oh, when when. I think when John was reading out something from the special grants and the special grants, and they mentioned the industrial group, that that was just one of the groups in uh, in what made up SMG. There were kids in high schools. There were people in, in white collar offices, uh, naturally at the universities as well. Uh, but we were really uh, actually this goes generally for the movement uh, in in Queensland, not just us. Even before, say, uh, the Maoists had worker student alliances down in Melbourne. Even the earlier movements in the 60s had really close relations uh, from universities into the public, and particularly in the uh, uh, you know, industrially ac active unionist public. So that, that was something that was a feature of the movement up here. Uh, but it became much, it became dominated by universities. But uh, it, it then moved again out into the community. So there was only a period where where university action really dominated everything, and that was um, the late 60s and into the 70s. Then it moved down into the public again, but SMG was always out in the public, and uh, and uh, we had, you know, we never stopped working. You know, we, we, you know, we, uh, we were attempt they attempt attempted to stop us, and I don't know who came up with this idea, but when we were standing outside high schools uh, handing out leaflets, we'd get stopped by the special branch all the time. So we came up with the idea. I wouldn't be surprised if it was Graham's idea. It was certainly a pugnacious idea uh, that uh, instead of standing around and getting stopped, we'd just arrive at lunchtime or in recess, run through the school handing out leaflets, which the kids just absolutely loved, uh, and then jump into cars and uh, and run away. So that's what we did. It was quite successful. But uh, the the thing that, that that struck me when when listening to some of the earlier remarks was, as I said, about skills. And this is something for the young people here. You just won't, you just won't be able to understand this. But when it's mentioned that uh, Esme used to uh, prepare uh, the stencils from which we leafleted, that 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 job, 
is absolutely crucial. I mean, you didn't just, you know, you, you couldn't just print things anywhere. You know, printing and just making literature was a bit more like Gutenberg's time than it was what things are like now. And I, I can remember sometimes, and I sort of guiltily recall Paul Esme uh, typing these things while we sometimes wrote them, standing around her, and, <laughs> and you know, she, you know, she's been typing away and doing things, mostly without complaining, but sometimes being quite pissed off. Quite rightly so. <laughs> so that so that was a you know a, a great because none of the rest of us could type. You know, that, <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, none of us could type. Uh, but um, and Graham, yeah, the same thing with uh, skills. A little bit like uh, Romulus, my father. You know, it was obvious that uh, Graham was. Uh, that's why he, when he talks about photography, what he actually says is, you know, getting that photograph of the guy leaping through that uh, hoop from the standing start. Uh, he, he said I always had good hand-eye coordination, and, and that that go, goes for everything. Uh, but we used to think it was crazy because. Um, we, he used to take us out and on some little truck you had, a little sort of ute type truck thing I vaguely remember. Or was that was that yours? Oh, Maybe right. it was yours. Mm. Uh, and we went out somewhere, I don't know where this was, somewhere out in the bush where you had this enormous pile of wood and stuff. And oh. uh, and we all just thought it was crazy. We didn't know what the hell he was on about. Mm. Nevertheless we, we took it back and built that, that uh, office with it. Um, and uh, I think Graham got got uh, various things like bits of um, Cloudland, didn't you? Uh, yeah. You went after Mac Peterson destroyed Cloudland. Uh, Graham got some of it, and we probably thought that was crazy too. But then he went and built this two-story two house with it, which unfortunately, as you've heard, got burnt down. So yeah, that was all quite impressive and quite enriching for for us all from our different backgrounds and uh, to to see a wide range of people working together like that was. It? Very rich experience, so I thank Graham and Esme for that. Yeah, like a soapbox. Yeah, like a soapbox. 